But hey, welcome to Compass Church this morning. We're so happy to have you here. Join us on the second Sunday of June. This, this is truly one of my favorite Sundays of the year. Ever since I first came into ministry as a, uh, a youth pastor, graduation Sunday has always been one of my very favorite Sundays. Definitely a top five Sunday. Maybe Easter's up there. Christmas or Christmas Eve, if that's a Sunday, that's up there too. But this is one of my favorite Sundays, and it's not just because these young people have done something and accomplished something that's, that's worthy of recognition, but because the accomplishments these people have just completed and, and made actually open the door for them to even do more for the kingdom of God and do more for Jesus. And, and I'm just so excited to see what they do and how they fulfill Jesus' final commandment called the Great Commission. Here at Compass, we know that you're never too young to do great things for the Lord. Amen? Amen. I was actually talking to my daughter on the way in. She said, Daddy, can I, can I go with you early to church? I said, as long as you're ready by 7.30, then we can go. And she was. So we were driving to church. And I was telling her a little bit about the sermon I have going on today. And, and I said, hey, what, what do you know about the Holy Spirit? And one of the things she said to me was, when you become a believer, no matter how old you are, you aren't given a portion of the Holy Spirit. You're given the whole thing. And that's an awesome thought because she understands, even at 13, and just like our 18 or 17-year-olds understand, that you can do powerful things for the kingdom regardless of age. We have people, we have a, a, a girl that was up here now already interning for our church. And we have one that was playing guitar over here. And we have, we have people working all over the place for the betterment of the kingdom and to make Jesus' name known. And even in a culture that says 30 is the new 18, our 18 and 17 and 16 year olds and even younger are doing some awesome things guided by the Holy Spirit and equipped by him to do great things for the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. So if there's one thing you take away from today, even before I start preaching on the sermon, it should be continued prayer for those seniors and, and recent graduates as well as future graduates, but continued prayer for them as they move on to new areas of their life where they have new opportunities and challenges for them to continue to seek Jesus and make him known. That's so exciting. So they will need prayer for that. Trust me, I, I've, I've been in college before, uh, so I get it. You, m many of you have as well. It's a place we need prayer for. So that's my challenge. That's one of my challenges for you this week. Continue praying for them. Don't, don't let the prayer that we had here today be the last prayer you have for them, but continue praying for them. And you may be wondering to yourself, Matt, you haven't even started the sermon yet and you're already challenging us. Don't worry, I have more challenges coming up for you. Because today, this morning, we continue our series called If Then. It's a series based on a concept called syllogism. That's just a fancy sounding word, but syllogism is, is, a, is a concept. It actually was first devised by Greek philosopher Aristotle in 350 BC. And it talks about how... Um, it's a directional conditional statement that says one concept or one event will lead to another concept or another event. So it says there, there's this one thing, if, will lead to this next thing, then. And uh, although Aristotle came up with it in 350 BC, where we see it, or actually we see more likely the effects of it, is within cu computer programming. And our phones and our smartphones and our computers and everything we use, all the technology we use, uses if-then statements within their programming. And that's where we see it most often. But it is something that we also see within Scripture. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But over this past week, I was talking to another pastor in town. We were just sharing about what we were doing over the summer, what we were teaching to our respective churches over the summer. And I was talking about this series, of course. I was really excited about it because I get to wrap you know, math with pastoring, which is both my passions. And you guys love math, so I figured it works out well. But I was talking to this pastor, and, and one of his church members was there, and his church member said to the pastor, hey, what do you think about incorporating more math into your sermons? And this pastor quickly quipped, I would, but it seems a little derivative. <laughs> I laughed at that math joke because I'm a big nerd, but then I thought to myself, math jokes from a pastor is, is kind of my thing, so you better stay in your lane, bro. No, I didn't say that. I'm just kidding. I think there are plenty of math jokes to be distributed around because they're always integral parts of sermons. Okay, if you've got those math jokes, then you're as much of a nerd as I am. But getting back to our series, our If Now series, I'm really excited about this. And last week we began this series by reading 
in John 14 to say, if you know Jesus, if you know Jesus, and if you know Jesus, then you know the Father. If you know Jesus, then you know the way, the truth, and the life. If you know Jesus, then you know what true life is. That's what we talked about last week. We read a part of Scripture that some theologians call the Upper Room Discourse. It's a portion of Scripture. It's multi-chapter passage in the Gospel of John where, where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's guiding them about what they are to do once he leaves. And it's, it's, really, it's really significant things that he teaches his disciples. But this discourse, discourse is just a conversation, right? This discourse takes place after his public ministry ends but before his very public crucifixion. And that's when this takes place, before his very public arrest and crucifixion. And last week we read the passage, verses 1 through 14 of John. And in that chapter, the very beginning of that chapter, which of course wasn't called chapter 14 or verse 1 at the time, but chapter 14 begins with Jesus giving a statement. And the statement he gives is, "...let not your hearts be troubled." Let not your hearts be troubled. And we dove into that pretty deep last week, so I'm not going to do it here. You can check it out on our our YouTube channel if you weren't there, or you just want to watch it again. But it also dawned on me, given this morning's topic, that that's not only something stated by Jesus, but it was a command to his disciples. It was a command. Let not your hearts be troubled. And while studying for the scene... Uh, this series, I learned that the language that John uses here in the first verse of this chapter, it's in present tense. It was in present tense in the Greek, and it continues to be in present tense if you look at the story. And It's in the imperative mode, and, and the language is in the passive form. What that means is, his disciples were already stressing out. His disciples already had their hearts troubled, and Jesus comes in and says, stop it. Just like that old Bob Newhart skip from Saturday Night Live right? Stop it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to Google that because it is hilarious. But he comes in and he says, hey, stop stressing out. And then he explains why and, and, and why they shouldn't. But here's what dawned on me. I wondered, would Jesus come in and give a direct command to one of his disciples that he didn't think they could, co- they could fulfill? Would he tell somebody something directly or a group of people directly to do something that, that we weren't able to do? It made me wonder, are we tricking ourselves when we say we can't control our emotions? I believe Jesus understood that we can control our emotions. We can be in control of our feelings. And I'm not saying that we 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 should stifle our emotions or or bottle them up or or do that, and that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when you're in control, you can process through them. You can work through them. You can share them with people who can come alongside you and support you through those tough times. Because, listen, I understand, and I'm sure Jesus understood, that life happens and some things in life are tough. That's a fact. Actually, if you read through the gospel, you'll recognize that the shortest verse in all of Scripture is two words. He wept. Jesus wept. So he's not saying that at no point should you not be emotional. He's saying, let your hearts not be troubled. That's what he's saying here. And controlling our emotions does not mean, again, ignoring them or stifling them or forgetting about them. That's not what Jesus is saying here. It means to process through them. And one of the ways Jesus and and God have have orchestrated our, our ability to process through them is through people we do fellowship with. Fellowship's just a Christian word for for doing life with, being around people. That's why the church is so important. We're told in Galatians to to carry one another's burdens. That's what this is all about. But please hear what Jesus is telling us through his conversation with his disciples then that we can have now that we should not let our hearts be troubled. And that is way, way easier when we know Jesus. That was the point of last week. If we know Jesus, then it's easier not having our hearts be troubled. And that is having a growing, active, and living relationship with Jesus. If you know Jesus. Well, this week we continue our series by picking up exactly where we left off last week. Last week we read through verses 1 through 14. This week we pick up at verse 15 in John chapter 14. 
And actually, what's really neat about this passage is the very first four words are the title of this morning's sermon. So if you're a note taker, here's the title of this morning's sermon. You can flip to John 14, look at verse 15, and see the first four words are there. If you love me. If you love me is the title of today's If Then series sermon. Our focus passage this morning runs through verse 21. We're going to read 15 through 21. And this morning, we're going to read through the the New Living Translation. We're going to do that because it's a Bible that we often give to either graduating seniors or high schoolers. It's a translation. It's also the Bible translation that we have in our New Believer Bags. If somebody comes to faith here at Compass, we want to give them a new believer bag. It's got a bunch of literature in it, but it's also got a Bible in it that's the New Living Translation. It's called the New Believer Bible, and that's what we read through. But this morning, as I was reading through the different translations, I really liked the New Living Translation. For me personally, just so so everyone kind of knows what I what I mean or how I think. Good luck with that. But here's here's what I do when I'm reading the Bible to read it my devotion time, I usually read the New Living Translation. I really like the way I find it to be true. I like the way it's worded. If I'm studying Scripture, sometimes I'm reading the New King James Version or ESV. But this morning, as I was reading through this passage, or not this morning, but uh, as I was reading through this passage preparing for this, I really like the New Living Translation, and you'll see why in a moment. But if you have an ESV Bible or an NIV or, or whatever translation, the meaning's the same as long as it's an actual translation. The words might be a little bit different or more modern, but they're the same. So go ahead and flip with me to John 14. I'm going to read along with it. If you have a a Bible on your phone, you can change the translation. We're going to read NLT. Here we go. It begins with verse 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now, and later he will be in you. Verse 18. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, since I live you also will live. Verse 20. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Before we move on, let's, let's pray real quick. Lord, I want to thank you first and foremost for uh, instilling with your Holy Spirit John's passion to write this stuff down helping us understand as disciples 2,000 years after you spoke them what we can learn from you. Uh, Lord, so thank you for that. And Lord, as we look uh, at these verses and what we can learn from them here in 2024, help it be in our heart to the point where we can see people the way you see people. We can see people made in your image who are worthy of love and worthy of your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, thank you for that and bless our time this morning. We love you in your name we pray. Amen. Man, what a passage, huh? This passage starts off with what I call a duh statement. But it's a duh statement that not everybody wants to accept. It's often thought to be abrasive or off-putting. That's what this, this first thing is, is, is thought to be. The overall if-then statement of today's message says, if you love me, then you'll obey me. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. You will keep my commands. Well, this rubs people in our culture the wrong way many times. Our culture wants to, wants to believe or wants us to believe that if you love me, you will agree with me. Or if you love me, you will affirm me in my decisions. If you love me, you will celebrate me. This is, this is what our culture wants us to believe. But Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now I want you to notice that, that what we are promoted to believe in culture and what Jesus calls us to promote are two different me's. When Jesus says that the me refers to him, God. God in the bod, as some people say. He came to this world to do something we couldn't do. He never stopped being God. He still remained being human at the same time. That's hard to understand and, and comprehend. 
but that's a different me than what culture says. The me that culture is referring to is self. And I want you to think about that word for a second, self. It seems like we've heard that before. Actually, Jesus has used that word before. Jesus used that word when he said, if you want to follow me, you must deny your self and follow me. You must pick up your cross and follow me. You have to deny yourself. And when he says this, it's important to understand that Jesus is saying that it's the self we need to deny if we're actually going to follow him and keep his commands. This point is so important that Jesus actually bookends this passage with it. Verse 15 and verse 21 bookend this passage, and they both say the same thing. They actually, it's a biconditional statement. Check this out. Verse 15 says, If you love me, then you'll keep my commandments. Verse 21 says, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. So he says the same thing backwards at the very end. And it all comes to, Do you love me? Jesus is saying, do you love me? Jesus makes it clear that a real true love for him will manifest itself in people through obedience. There's a word we don't want to hear very often. Obedience, specifically to anything other than ourselves. Today we're promoted to obey ourselves. And it's masked in the marketable phrase, be be your authentic self. Be your authentic self. Hey, listen, As a follower of Christ, I don't want to be my authentic self. That's why I needed savings in the first place. My authentic self was a mess. But I do want to authentically obey Jesus because I authentically love him because he authentically loved me first. That's authentic love. Loving Jesus is not just about having warm feelings towards him or or getting a what would Jesus do bracelet, but to know and obey his teachings and live in accordance to His will. That's what really loving Jesus is all about. You know somebody loves Jesus if they live according to His will. Now we're to do this in good times and bad. And that sometimes is where the challenge lies, doesn't it? Because sometimes when life is good or when life is bad, loving Jesus and obeying His commandments are a challenge. And if we're honest, maybe that's why loving is so feels so difficult because sometimes we don't want to obey Jesus. Sometimes we don't want to walk along the path that Jesus has outlined for us. Sometimes we simply want to do what we want to do and leave Jesus out of it. That's a human aspect. We may want to entertain or give in to other desires that aren't in line with Jesus' will. But Jesus reminds us twice that if we love him, We will obey him. Okay, so does Jesus have an answer to how we ought to do that when it's so difficult? It turns out that's what's in between those bookends. Verse 15 to verse 21, in between them, talks about how we're supposed to do this. Just look at verses 16 and 17 for a moment. Jesus comes off of, if you love me, you'll keep my commands with... And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. That's powerful. The second if-then statement for today is if you love Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit. Just like the great theologian Aubrey Collins said this morning, when you become a follower of Jesus, when you choose to follow him, you get the whole spirit, the whole thing. He fills you up. Actually, I was talking to her today, and it dawned on me. Sometimes we say the Holy Spirit fills our heart, and yes, he does. He fills our whole body, though. That's important to recognize. Because sometimes we think, oh, the Holy Spirit's here, but it's not here, so I can ignore it. That's not true. The Holy Spirit fills your entire body. In verse 16, Jesus makes a promise. And it's a wonderful promise. One that we often dismiss or at least not take full advantage of. Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit to his disciples. His disciples then and now. And this Holy Spirit will guide them and us. 
It will help them and us, and it will never leave them or us. Verse 17 gives us a description of the Holy Spirit. And it's important to look at this. Jesus uses a personified pronoun for the Holy Spirit. He. Jesus doesn't say it. He does, it's not the force. It's not the universe. The Holy Spirit is a he. It's part of the Trinity. The triune Godhead. Trinity is not found in the Bible, but it's a concept. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are three separate entities who are one in God. And he talks about the Holy Spirit. He says he... The Holy Spirit leads into all truth. He, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us, helps us discern between right and wrong, between truth and falsehood. He, the Holy Spirit, who will never leave us, counsels us in hard times and leads us to a deeper relationship with Jesus. He, the Holy Spirit, who is the Advocate, helps us live in obedience to Jesus and His command. How are we supposed to keep the commands of Jesus? Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit is an amazing gift, but it's a gift that we often forget about as we go from one part of life to another. One issue in life to another. One problem in life to another problem in life. Hey, how about one blessing to another? Hey, don't be fooled. People forget about the Holy Spirit just as much in times of blessings as they do in times of hardship. We need to keep the Holy Spirit first and foremost in our life and recognize that He lives in us. He never leaves us. The Holy Spirit is meant to be part of our whole life, to do all of life with us because He resides in us. That's where He resides, in us, our whole body and our whole life. The study of the Holy Spirit in Christian theology is called pneumatology. Go ahead and say that with me. Pneumatology. Pneumatology. And I think that at least in part, one of the reasons people don't utilize the Spirit in their life nearly as much is because it seems so confusing and complex and hard to understand. I mean, the word pneumatology even starts with a P. Who would have thought about that? Right? But although God, who the Holy Spirit is, cannot be fully understood or comprehended, There are aspects we are meant to understand fully and incorporate fully into our lives. There are three resources that help us understand the Holy Spirit, how He's working in and on our lives. And I put these, I'm going to give these three to you, so if you're a note taker, here you go. I put these three things in order of priority and importance as well as ease of use. The first one, the Bible. There's a lot to say about the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And there's four verses. Four verses that illustrate who the Holy Spirit is and what He is to us. There's more than that, but I chose four. The first, Romans 8.9. Romans 8.9 says, But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Now we know that as followers of Christ, we do have that. So Paul says in Romans that if you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. We who belong to Christ have the Holy Spirit. That's one verse. The second one is Galatians 4, 6. And because we are His children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Ephesians 2.22 Through Him, you Gentiles, that's what most of us are. Gentiles are non-Jews. Through Him, you Gentiles are also being made part of His dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. And then the ever-famous one, 1 Corinthians 6.19 Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. You were bought with a high price. These four verses stress the Holy Spirit is with us and in us, helping us and guiding us and comforting us as we walk through this life as a follower of Jesus Christ. These verses remind us that because the Holy Spirit resides in us, we are connected back to God the Father and God the Son. These four verses remind us of that. 
So again, write these down. Think about these over the next week as you process through this if-then statement of this series. Romans 8, 9, Galatians 4, 6, Ephesians 2, 22, and 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. The second resource I have for you is my go-to resource when I have a Bible or Christian question. It's gutquestions.org. Now, I'm not sponsored by them. I'm not paid for them. I'm not advertising for them. But I think they are an awesome resource. That, and their, their tagline here is, the Bible has answers. We'll help you find them. One thing I love about gut questions is everything they state has a Bible reference with it. They take everything back to Scripture. So if you're wondering, and actually this morning I tried this out. I typed in, who is the Holy Spirit? Actually, I think I typed in, what is the Holy Spirit? Just to see what it would do. But I, when I typed it in, a whole page of resources came up. The first one gave all kinds of information about who the Spirit is. And they usually whittle it down to about one page. Talk about taking a complex idea and helping a person understand it in lay terms. It's great. So number one is the Bible. Number two is gutquestions.org. Number three is actually a book. We have tons of books on the Holy Spirit. One of my favorites called Forgotten God by Francis Chan. We actually have it in our library here. Actually, I think I lent it out uh, recently. But it's one of my favorite. And it talks about how the, the Holy Spirit is often forgotten after God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. How we can incorporate it back into our lives. I actually, now I'm a slow reader. I'm not a very fast reader. But I read through this book in one single day. It was a summer day. The weather was okay. It was like 75 degrees, partly cloudy. I just sat in my backyard and read it. And I got through it. And I finished and I was like, oh my goodness. That's the fastest I think I've ever read a book. Including comic books. But it's it's an awesome read by Francis Chan. It's one of those books that, of course you can borrow it from us. But I'd buy it and have a copy of it. It's that good. And Francis also does a good job of referencing back to Scripture. It's tied to Scripture. That's why I like it so much. But so we've looked at a couple if-thans so far. If you love Jesus, you'll keep my commands. If you love Jesus, you'll be given the Holy Spirit. We're going to finish by looking at this last portion of passage here, John 14, verses 18 through 21. Jesus says, no, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father, and that you are in me, and that I am in you. (coughs) Excuse me. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love you. And I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them. So the final if then for this morning is if you love Jesus, then you are never alone. If you love Jesus, you are never alone. So if you love Jesus, you'll obey his commands. If you love Jesus, you'll get the Holy Spirit. If you love Jesus, you are never alone. Jesus promises here that he will not abandon us. Even if you are in a time in your life where you feel all alone, And there's no one there to lean on. Jesus promises that he will be there. That he is there. You know who I think understood this really well? The Apostle Paul. I think the Apostle Paul understood this really well. After going on three missionary journeys, planting dozens of churches, being beaten countless times. Actually, the Bible says beaten more times than I can remember. I don't know how many times you have to be beat to not remember how many times you've been beaten, but that was Paul. Shipwrecked. Whipped. He actually stood in trial all alone, at least humanly speaking. We read about 